The Torture Garden, Octave Mirbeau, Introduction. One evening some friends were gathered at the home of one of our most celebrated writers. Having dined sumptuously, they were discussing the murder. Apropos of what, I no longer remember, probably apropos of nothing. Only men were present, moralists, poets, philosophers, and doctors. Thus everyone would speak freely, according to his whim, his hobby, or his idiosyncrasies, without fear of suddenly seeing that expression of horror and fear which the least startling idea traces upon the horrified face of a notary. I say notary, much as I might have said lawyer or porter, not disdainfully, of course, but in order to define the average French mind, with a calmness of spirit as perfect as though he were expressing an opinion upon the merits of the cigar he was smoking, a member of the Academy of Moral and Political Sciences said, Really, I honestly believe that murder... I honestly believe that murder is the greatest human preoccupation, and that all our acts stem from it. We awaited the pronouncement of an involved theory, but he remained silent. Absolutely, said a Darwinian scientist. And, my friend, you are voicing one of those eternal truths, such as the legendary Monsieur de l'Epalisse discovered every day. Since murder is the very bedrock of our social institutions, and consequently the most imperious necessity of civilized life, if it no longer existed, there would be no governments of any kind, by virtue of the admirable fact that crime in general, and murder in particular, are not only their excuse, but their only reason for being. We should then live in complete anarchy, which is inconceivable." So instead of seeking to eliminate murder, it is imperative that it be cultivated with intelligence and perseverance. I know no better culture medium than law. Someone protested. Hear, hear, asked the savant. Aren't we alone in speaking frankly? Please, said the host, let us profit thoroughly by the only occasion when we are free to express our personal ideas, for both in my books, and you in your turn, may present only lies to the public. The scientist settled himself once more among the cushions of his armchair, stretched his legs, which were numb from being crossed too long, and, his head thrown back, his arms hanging, and his stomach soothed by good digestion, puffed smoke rings at the ceiling. Besides, he continued, murder is largely self-propagating. Actually, it is not the result of this or that passion, nor is it a pathological form of degeneracy. It is a vital instinct which is in us all, which is in all organized beings and dominates them, just as the genetic instinct. And most of the time, it is especially true that these Two instincts fuse so well and are so totally interchangeable that in some way or other they form a single and identical instinct, so that we no longer may tell which of the two urges us to give life and which to take it, which is murder and which love. I have been the confidant of an honorable assassin who killed women not to rob them but to ravish them. His trick was to manage things so that his sexual climax coincided exactly with the death spasm of the woman. At those moments, he told me, I imagined I was a god creating a world. Ah, cried the celebrated writer, if you are going to seek your examples among professional assassins... Hold on, the scientist replied. Simply that we are all more or less assassins. I like to believe that intellectually we have all experienced analogous sensations to a lesser degree. We restrain the innate need of murder and attenuate physical violence by giving it a legalized outlet. Industry, colonial trade, war, the hunt, or anti-Semitism. Because it is dangerous to abandon oneself to it immoderately and outside the law. And since, after all, the moral satisfaction we derive from it is not worth exposing ourselves to the ordinary consequences of the act. Imprisonment, testimony before judges, always tiring and scientifically uninteresting. And finally, le guillotine. You're exaggerating, interrupted the first speaker. Murder is a dangerous business only for inelegant. Murderers. 
Witless and impulsive brutes who lack all psychological understanding, an intelligent and rational man may, with ineffable serenity, commit all the murders he desires. He is assured of immunity. The superiority of his calculations will always prevail against the routine of police investigation and, let us admit it, against the puerility of the criminal investigations with which presiding magistrates enjoy dabbling. In this business, as in all others, it is the small who pay for the great. Come, my friend, surely you admit that the number of crimes which go unprosecuted and tolerated, and tolerated, I was about to say that, you will admit that that sum is a thousand times greater than the number of discovered and punished crimes, about which the papers chatter with such strange prolixity, and with so repugnant a lack of understanding. If you will admit that, then concede that the gendarmerie is no hobgoblin to the intellectuals of murder. Undoubtedly, but that's not the question. You are clouding the issue. I said that murder is a normal and not at all exceptional function of nature and all living beings. So it is exorbitant of society, under pretext of governing men, to have abrogated the exclusive right to kill them to the detriment of the individuals in whom alone this right resides. Quite true, said an amiable and verbose philosopher, whose lectures at the Sorbonne draw select attendance every week. Our friend is quite right. As far as I am concerned, I do not believe that a human being exists who is not, basically at least, an assassin. Look, when I am in a drawing room, a church, a station, on the terrasse of a café, at the theatre, or wherever crowds pass or loiter, I enjoy considering faces from a strictly homicidal point of view. For you may see by the glance, by the back of the neck, the shape of the skull, the jawbone, and zygoma of the cheeks, or by some part of their persons that they bear the stigmata of that psychological calamity known as murder. It is scarcely an aberration of my mind, but I can go nowhere without seeing it flickering beneath eyelids or without feeling its mysterious contact in the touch of every hand held out to me. Last Sunday I went to a town on the festival day of its patron saint. In the public square, which was decorated with foliage, floral arches, and poles draped with flags, was grouped every kind of amusement common to that sort of public celebration, and beneath the paternal eye of the authorities a swarm of good people were enjoying themselves. The wooden horses, the roller coaster, and the swings drew a very meagre crowd. The organs wheezed their gayest tunes and most bewitching overtures in vain. Other pleasures absorbed this festive throng. Some shot with rifles, pistols, or the good old crossbow at targets painted like human faces. Others hurled balls, knocking over marionettes ranged pathetically on wooden bars. Still others, mallet in hand, pounded upon a spring which animated a French sailor who patriotically transfixed with his bayonet a poor hover or a mocking Dahomian. Everywhere, under tents or in the little lighted booths, I saw counterfeits of death, parodies of massacre, portrayals of hecatombs, and how happy these good people were. Everyone realized the philosopher was launched upon his subject, so we settled ourselves as best we could to withstand the torrent of his theories and anecdotes. He continued, I noticed that these gentle pastimes have for some years been undergoing a considerable development. The joy of killing has become greater and, besides, has become popularized in proportion to the spread of social refinement. Uh, For make no mistake, customs do change. Formerly, when we were still uncultivated, the Sabbath shooting galleries were a monotonously sorry sight to see. They only shot at pipes and eggshells dancing upon jets of water. In the more sumptuous establishments, they actually had birds, but they were made of plaster. I ask you what fun was there in that? Today, progress has made it legal for every good man to procure himself the delicate and edifying emotion of assassination for a couple of sous into the bargain. 
You may still win colored plates and rabbits, but instead of pipes, eggshells, and plaster birds, which smash stupidly without suggesting anything bloody to us, the showman's imagination has substituted figures of men, women and children, carefully jointed in costumes as they should be. Then they have made these figures gesticulate and walk by means of an ingenious mechanism. They walk happily along or flee terrified. You see them appear alone or in groups, in decorative settings, scaling walls, entering dungeons, tumbling out of windows, popping up out of trap doors. They function just like real beings and move their arms, legs, and heads. Some appear to be weeping, some seem to be paupers, some invalids, and there are some dressed in gold like legendary princesses. Really, you can believe that they possess intelligence, a will, a soul, that they are alive. Some even assume pathetic attitudes. You can almost hear them cry, Mercy, don't kill me. It is an exquisite sensation to imagine you are going to kill things that move, suffer, and implore. Something like a taste of warm blood comes to your mouth when you aim the rifle or the pistol at them. What a thrill when the shot decapitates these make-believe men. What a clamor when the arrow splits their cardboard breasts and lays the little inanimate bodies low. In corpse-like postures, everybody gets excited, intent, and eggs the others on. You hear nothing but expressions of destruction and death. Kill him! Aim at his eye and aim at his heart! He got his. No matter how indifferent these good people are to the targets and the pipes, they become elated when the mark represents a human being. The clumsy ones grow angry, not with their own awkwardness, but with the marionette they have missed. They call it a coward and overwhelm it with vile insults when it disappears intact behind the door of a dungeon. They challenge it. Come on out, you bum. They begin to fire at it again until they have killed it. Consider these good people. At that moment they are really assassins, beings moved solely by the desire to kill. The homicidal monster which up to then had slumbered in them awakens with the illusion that they are going to destroy. the illusion that they are going to destroy something living. For the little fellow of cardboard, sawdust, or wood which moves back and forth amid the scenery is no longer a toy to them, or a bit of lifeless material. Watching it pass back and forth, they unconsciously endow it with warm blood, sensitive nerves, thought, all those things it is so bitterly sweet to annihilate, and so fiercely delicious to see oozing from the wounds you have inflicted. They even go so far as to ascribe political and religious convictions to it, contrary to their own, accusing it of being a Jew, an Englishman, or a German. In order to add a particular hate to this general hatred of life, and thus augment the instinctive pleasure of killing by a personal vengeance intimately relished. Here the host interrupted out of politeness to his guests, and with the charitable desire of permitting our philosopher and us a breathing space, he objected quietly. You're only talking of brutes, peasants who I concede are always inclined toward murder, but it is not possible for you to apply the same observations to cultivated minds, disciplined natures, or cultured individuals every day of whose lives witnesses victories over native instinct and the savage vestiges of atavism. To which our philosopher eagerly replied, Allow me, what are the habits, my friend, and the preferred pleasures of those whom you call cultivated minds and disciplined natures? Fencing, dueling, violent sports, the abominable pigeon shoot, bullfighting, the various manifestations of patriotism, hunting, everything which is in reality only a reversion to the period of old-time barbarity, when man, if we may say so, was, as far as mortal culture is concerned, on the same plane with the wild beasts he pursued. After all, we need not complain that the hunter survived all the slightly altered trappings of earlier customs. It is a powerful counter-irritant through whose agency cultivated minds and disciplined natures, unquote, are enabled, without too much harm to us, to drain off what destructive energy and bloody passion still remains in them. Without it, instead of coursing deer, finishing off the boar and slaughtering innocent game, birds in the meadows, you may be sure that the cultivated minds would turn their packs on our trail. 
we would be the ones whom the disciplined natures, unquote, would joyfully mow down with rifle fire, which they do not fail to do when they obtain the power, through some means or another, and with more determination and, let us frankly admit it, less hypocrisy than the brute peasant. And let us never look forward to the disappearance of game from our fields. And forests, it is our safeguard, and after a fashion our ransom. The day it finally disappears, it will not be long before we take its place for the exquisite enjoyment of the cultivated minds. The Dreyfus affair affords us an excellent example, and never, I believe, was the passion for murder and the joy of the manhunt so thoroughly and cynically displayed. The pursuit of Monsieur Grimaud through the streets of Nantes remains the most characteristic of the startling incidents and monstrous events to which it gave opportunity daily during the past year. And it accrues to the honor of the cultivated minds and disciplined natures, unquote, who saw to it that this great savant, to whom we are indebted for the most brilliant researches in chemistry, was overwhelmed with indignities and threats of death. In this connection, we must always remember the Femer of Clisson, quote, a cultivated mind, unquote, in a letter which was made public, refused to allow Monsieur Grimaud to enter his town, and regretted that modern laws did not permit him to hang him high and dry, a thing which befell savants in the lovely days of the ancient monarchies. And for that, this excellent mayor was strongly commended by all whom France numbers among those exquisite, quote, worldly personalities, unquote, who, according to our host, win such brilliant victories every day over original instinct and the savage vestiges of atavism. Notice also that it is from among the cultivated minds and disciplined natures that officers are almost exclusively recruited. Men, that is to say, who neither more nor less wicked nor stupid than others, freely choose freely choose a calling, a highly honored calling, moreover, in which every intellectual effort is bent toward committing the most diversified violations upon the human being, and in developing and compiling the most complete, far-reaching, and certain means of pillage, destruction, and death. Aren't there warships to which we have given the perfectly logical and understandable names of devastation, fury, terror? As for me, listen to this. I'm positive that I believe I am a normal man, with affections, high sentiments, superior culture, and the refinements of civilization and sociability. Well, how often have I heard the imperious voice of murder snarling in me? How often have I felt the desire rising in a surge of blood from the depths of my being to my brain, that bitter, violent, and almost invincible desire to kill? Do not believe that this desire arose in a passionate crisis, accompanied a sudden, unreflective rage, or was combined with a keen lust for money. Not at all. This desire is born suddenly, powerful and unjustified in me for no reason and apropos of nothing. In the street, for example, behind the back of an unknown pedestrian. Yes, there are some backs on the street which cry for the knife. Why? After this unexpected revelation, the philosopher was silent for a moment and looked at us all in alarm. Then he continued. No, you see, the moralists have split hairs in vain. The need to kill is born in man with the need to eat, and merges with it this instinctive need, which is the mainspring of all living organisms. It's developed by education instead of being restrained, and is sanctified by religion instead of being denounced. Everything conspires to make it the pivot upon which our admirable society revolves. As soon as man awakens... As soon as man awakens to consciousness, we instill the spirit of murder in his mind. Murder, expanded to the status of a duty and popularized to the point of heroism, accompanies him through all the stages of his existence. He is made to adore uncouth gods, mad, furious gods, who are only gratified by cataclysms, and ferocious maniacs that they are gorge themselves with human lives and mow down nations like fields of wheat. He is made to respect only heroes, those disgusting brutes saddled with crime and red with human blood. 
the virtues by which he rises above others and which with him glory, fortune, and love are based entirely upon murder. In war he discovers the supreme synthesis of the eternal and everlasting folly of murder, regulated, regimented, and obligatory, a national function. Wherever he goes, whatever he does, he will always see that word, murder, immortally inscribed upon the pediment of that vast slaughterhouse, humanity. Then why do you expect this man, in whom the scorn of human life is inculcated from infancy, and whom we consecrate to legalized slaughter, why, oh why, do you expect him to recoil from murder when he finds in it interest or distraction? In the name of what law could society condemn assassins who in reality have only conformed to the homicidal laws which it dictates and followed the bloody example which it sets them? Why is it? Why is it, assassins might readily say, that you force us to overpower groups of men whom we do not hate, whom we do not even know? Then the more we overwhelm them, the more you overwhelm us with rewards and honors. Then again, trusting in your logic, we destroy people because they hamper us or we detest them or because we covet their money, their wives, their positions, or simply because we enjoy destroying them all of which are concise, plausible, and human reasons. And along comes the gendarme, the judge, and the hangman. Here is a revolting injustice which is perfectly senseless. What could society reply to that, if it had the slightest regard for logic? A young man who had been silent until then said, Is this really the explanation of that strange murderous mania by which you maintain we are all originally or willfully tainted? I do not think so, and I do not wish to. I prefer to believe that everything about us is mysterious. Furthermore, this satisfies the indolence of my mind, uh, which has a horror of solving social and human problems which, besides, are never solved. And it strengthens the reasons, the purely poetic reasons, by which I am tempted to explain, or rather not to explain, everything which I do not understand. You have just made quite a terrible disclosure, Doctor, and described impressions which, if they were to assume active form, might lead you far afield, and me also. For I have often experienced these impressions, and quite recently under the following exceptionally banal circumstances. But first permit me to add that I ascribe these abnormal states of mind to the environment in which I was brought up, and the daily influences which affected me unaware. 